and welcome. Welcome, and uh, we'll start, of course, with our bracha. Baruch atah, Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Kichana B'mitzvotah V'tzivanu, La'asok B'divrei Torah. Amen. Thank you. And we are in the middle of the Ten Commandments. So uh, we just had a commandment about honoring your father and your mother. And uh, here we are moving on now. And that had, of course, bore with it a reward. And uh, now we're on to a few that come together. Lord Tirzach, you shall not murder. Lord Tinaf, you shall not commit adultery. Lord Tignov, you shall not steal. Lord Ta'ane Bereacha, Aid Shakir, you shall not bear uh, false witness before your neighbor. You shall not testify falsely against your neighbor. So let's. Go into the Rashi here. So, Lord Tinaf, he doesn't, murder does not require a, at least in this particular point, it does not require any further commentary on his part. The question is, what is the definition of adultery? And he says, Ain Niof, Ella, adultery only applies per Eshet Ish, if the woman is married. Okay, doesn't mean that you can do other kinds of things. But if a woman is married then and, and a man, whether the man is single or the man is married, makes no difference uh, if he, he will have committed adultery with her <clears throat> if she is married. And I, while I we are not looking necessarily for rationalizations uh, for the mitzvahs, I think a lot has to do with knowing the um, paternity of the child. Uh, so that's, I think, part of what, what's going on there as to why we're talking specifically about a married woman and the idea of trying to get away from any taint of prostitution. And how do we know this? Yes, go ahead. If a man has, if a married man, for instance, has relations with a single woman right. that's not his wife, Correct. I'm not sure how we would know necessarily the origin of the child or have a taint of prostitution there as well. It's true. It's That's why we don't look for rationalization. Good point. There's no guarantee. Absolutely. Right. I'm just saying it may be, but it was just, it, I was just reflecting on possible, of trying to come up with some sort of possible rationale. It's true. And at that point, by the way, uh, the man, there are other laws that might require them to get married. He has to take care of her. So, and I think there are other issues having to do with the general culture that I may be unaware of. So, anyway, how do we know this? Shinemar, the reason is in, in, ex, in excuse me, Leviticus chapter 20, it says, Mot yumat hanoef vahanoefet, because there it says, uh, the, the one, the man who commits adultery and the woman who commits adultery shall be put to death. But Omer, and again in Ezekiel chapter 17, it says, Ha'isha ha'mina efet tachat isha. There it clarifies that it's a, a, a woman who commits adultery. Literally, it means under her husband, meaning being in her husband's, uh, being, being the wife of her husband. Okay? Tikach et zarim, you shall... Literally, I think he's just going um, on with the verse from Ezekiel, right? You shall, literally it means you shall take the strange ones, right? The So, czar means a, a stranger, some something that doesn't belong. So, but the point is that it talks about just the woman here and in relationship to her husband. So that's how you know it's strictly a married woman. Lo tignov, it says you shall not steal. And this is uh, an interesting point here. Begonev nefashot hakatuv medaber. Scripture is referring strictly to kidnapping, to stealing souls. 
because lo tignovu, and when it says later on in, in Leviticus chapter 19, where it says thou shalt not steal, the gonev mamon. There it's referring to someone who steals property. But the in, in the Ten Commandments, the context is kidnapping. So, o eno elazeh begonev, but we could argue, maybe this case has to do with the one who steals property or money. And maybe Leviticus 19, you know, what, what makes you decide that Leviticus 19 is about money and, and that this isn't about money? This is about kidnapping. So, amarta, so you can argue. Davar halamed me'inyano. That what you do is you look at the context and 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 you can infer from the context. Ma lo tirzach, just as so since it's all connected, just as you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery. Medaber bedavar shechayevim alav mitat beitin, that just as in the case of the uh, murder and the adultery, uh, scripture is talking about something which you are punished you know, uh, a capital punishment administered by a court. They all involve punishments admitted, administered by a court. Af, so then the context of this stealing is also af lo tignov. Here where it says you shall not steal, davar shechayav alav mitat beitin. We have to be talking about something which requires, if if in fact it's, it's, it's proved to be a capital case, that it's administered by a court. So context tells you, because we know that kidnapping is something that is a capital offense, whereas uh, stealing money, etc., there's a way to make restitution. So interesting, though, interesting, because, um, you know, people who captured people, slaves, enslaved people, are basically uh, kidnapping in order to accomplish that. You know, it's essentially a capital offense. And one of the things I try to learn from these kinds of passages where they speak about capital offenses is that it's a way of the Torah telling us how absolutely uh, wrong these things are, the level of criminality involved in all of this, that it's on the level of a capital offense and not necessarily that one should be putting people to death going on this is <clears throat> last the uh, the last uh, commandment lo tahmod beit re'echa you shall not covet your neighbor's house lo tahmod eshet re'echa you shall not covet the wife of your neighbor ba'avdo nor his slave his manservant ba'amato nor his female servant the shoro, nor his ox, the chamoro, nor his donkey, the chol, and then we say, you know, we've specified some, but then we go to say, the chol asher lereecha. In other words, anything that is the property of your neighbor, you should not covet. Take a look here. Okay. Uh, Rashi right here. Uh, nope. There's no, there's no comment. Rashi does not feel a need to comment on this particular section, but we will have plenty of Torah Tamima on that when we, if it, with God's help, we ever get it, get to it. Going on. And the entire nation, you know, that's all the Israelites gathered there and those who had joined them, saw or, or see the voices, the etalapidim, and the flames of the torches, the lapid is a torch, the et kol ha shofar, and they, the sound of the shofar, the et hahar ashen, and the mountain smoking, vayar ha'am, and the people fell in fear, the yanu'u, they fell back, the ya'amdu merachok, and they stood from afar. This was such an awesome moment that they stood from afar. Uh, we can take a look at the Rashi and then have some thoughts about it. And the entire nation saw. 
Melamed. So this teaches you because it says all the nation, right? That teaches you echad someh. That teaches you that not one of them was blind because the entire nation saw every single person. Uminain bahem ilaim. And how do we know that there wasn't a single one of them that was mute? Talmud Lomar, this we we learn elsewhere where it says, Vaya'anu kol ha'am. It says, and all, it says this word kol, right? The entire nation responded. Uminain, and how do we know? Shalohayabahem cheresh. And how do we know that not a single one of them was deaf? Talmud Lomar, because they say later on, we read, it says, Naase venishma. Right? It says, we will do, and literally it means we will hearken. And this is based on commentary, early commentary in the Mechil Tah. How about this getting back to Ro'im et HaKolot? They saw the voices. Ro'im et HaNishma. They see something that is heard. So it sounds like it's contradictory. She'i'efshar so I'm, I think what he's saying is something that could not be seen in any other circumstance. Literally, it means in another place. So they had a level of perception, we would have to say, that was unique in that particular case. That's how I would understand what Rashi is telling us here, that we just have to accept it at face value that somehow they were able to see something that normally is just heard. Et hakolot, the voices. Hayotzim mi pi hakvura. And maybe this is explaining in some ways or helping us understand this a little bit better. The the sounds, the kolot, the sounds, hayotzim, which were emanating uh, from the mouth of God, hakvura, the ultimate power. Vayan, vayanu, right? I believe is what it is, right? Vayanu. Ein Noah. So he takes this word to explain it a little bit better the Hebrew. Ein Noah ela zia. So he says here it refers to trembling. He says the word Noah refers to trembling. So we have a different, Safaria gives a different translation here. I don't know if it's based on JPS, Jewish Publication Society translation, but at any rate, according to Rashi, he, he, we would say all the people trembled. And they stood from a distance. They were startled backwards. They were so astounded, they sort of jumped back, the Achorehem backwards. Yud bet mil, 12 miles. Ke'orech uh, machanehem, it was it it, it um, corresponded to the length of the encampment. Umalache hasharit ba'im, and ministering angels came umisayin otan and uh, help helped them, gave them assistance lahachziran to bring them back to that original place. And how do we know that? There's an allusion to it in the book of Psalms. Shin Ne'emar, it says in Psalm uh, 68, Malche Tzvaot. Okay, so this, it, I don't know if it says kings, but he's understanding when it says Malche Tzvaot, he's understanding as uh, ministering angels, right? Although Yedudun, Yedudun, they move, they move from the root nod, right? Cain is a wanderer, na venad. So it's interesting because Mal Melech is a king, Malach is an angel. So I'd have to, it didn't occur to me as I was preparing this to go back to uh, Psalms uh, 68 and see what it says. But at least they're reading Malchet Tzvaot, uh, the the kings of armies, something like that, the kings of hosts. And even so, maybe they're still understanding it as meaning uh, angels. And look at this, see there, Malache. It's spelled a little with the Aleph in there. And again, um, you know, it's something to reflect on in terms of 
their reaction and the need for divine assistance from these angels to bring them back to stand where they were. <clears throat> and, you know, in trying to reflect a little bit on what is actually going on here, right? They are, if you think about sort of the, the whole picture, they're standing here and receiving divine commandments and understanding that as being a watershed moment for human beings to recognize that as human beings, we have this relationship to the creator, to the one who created the universe. And sometimes I like to explain to people that believing in God has a lot to do with trying to understand your place in the universe, which of course is again a reflection of that ultimate question, which is, what's my significance? Yes, Lauren. Well, well Chabad does translate it as kings. Okay. And, um, but what I don't understand is plural kings, meaning what? Because um, there would be only one king in the heavens. They were talking about human kings. In other words, the idea that that kings were moved and overpowered in a sense by the divine. But like in was it Lachadodi? It says Malachi Hasharei Malachi Elyon. Yes, right. That's Malachi. So we're talking about angels and okay. not okay, not kings. In in Lachadodi, they okay. were talking about ministering angels and uh, the, the of the of the of the highest one of the yes, right the the one who is highest angels are the ones who's, who are highest. But the context of the Psalms, I think, is that as powerful as human rulers might consider themselves, they they nevertheless would be moved by, by God. So this, this, this moment is sort of seen as a moment, when I say confrontation, I don't mean in a negative sense. I mean in a positive sense, that they were, this is sometimes, of course, referred to as Revelation with a capital R. And and the fact that they are so frightened, and that's part of our, you know, lack of belief in God is that that we just don't sense that there's something that, you know, that we ultimately are in the presence of, and and that is of an extraordinary, extraordinary power and and presence. And that's why they they did not they felt they couldn't remain in that presence. In other words, I'm I'm trying to analyze the image of them being, you know, trembling, being in such fear and and jumping back twelve miles. And again, the significance of it being the the length of the, the encampment. So again, you know, what significance does that idea of the length of the encampment be? You know, again possibly saying that sometimes, you know, when we're encamped, using that in a met metaphoric sense, uh, we feel far more secure than perhaps we have a right to feel. And that to feel a certain level of insecurity in the presence of the divine isn't inappropriate. In fact, maybe it is extremely appropriate. But again, I'm just trying to take in what I'm, what I sense might be some of the literary images that are going on here at this particular watershed moment. And so why, why are we going into these kinds of details as to how they reacted? Because if, you, if we really felt commanded, we would have a sense of obligation that, that uh, we don't feel. And, and a very, very deep one that, that sort of goes to the very you know, essence of who we are as human beings. But at the same time, being aware of that is also allowing us to sense our own significance because that's how we achieve it, is by responding in this particular way to, you know, in terms of observing divine commandments. Anyway, uh, going on. So, Vayomru El Moshe, and they said to Moses, the Israelites said to Moses, that this is also an extremely important moment. So they said, You speak to us, and we will listen. We'll, we'll, uh, we will 
be commanded. We will understand. We will we will do what you tell us. For al yidaver imanu Elohim penamut, and may God not speak to us lest we die. And again, I said this is a a very interesting sentence because it's giving us a lot of insight in terms of that relationship as mortal human beings we have to something as profound as the divine creator. But it's also very important that what they're saying is they don't need to be in direct presence with the divine in order to respond to divine commandment. And this is actually considered to be a very positive statement on their part, that they're willing to trust Moses at this point. I mean, they had to go through what they went through to realize that what Moses was telling them wasn't just uh, hogwash. Go on, going on to the next verse. <clears throat> Excuse me. Vayome Moshe el Ha'am. Moses said to the people, Al Tirau, do not be afraid. In other words, don't be afraid that you're going to lose your lives at this particular moment. Ki avur nasot etchem, because it was for the purpose of nasot could mean to test you. Rashi's going to give us a different interpretation. Ha Elohim, ha Elohim, has God ar ar arrived? God has come today to test you. But we'll see. He understands Nasot in a different way. Uva Avur, and with the purpose, Tia Yir Ato Alpnechem, in that your fear of him be literally it means on your faces. But I think what it's saying is that you should live, you know, you should demonstrate uh, a sense of being in fear of God. The Vilti Tehtau so that you do not sin. And that's how I've always understood that term God-fearing, that someone who's God-fearing is not going to sin, even though they might be all by themselves and be tempted very much because they don't believe anyone else is aware of what they're doing that's wrong. But because they fear God and God is everywhere and conscious of everything, they won't sin. They won't fall into sin. So that's uh, so. We here we in fact see a connection with Yirat Hashem, with the fear of God, with not sinning. Right. So both the positive on the positive sense, uh, to to perform positive commandments and not to violate negative commandments. Rashi. The va'avur nasotetche. So he translates nasa, naso, as to raise you. In other words, in, for the sake of raising you up. Le gadel etchem, right? To make you great. Ba'olam in the world. She yetze lachem shem, that a, a, a reputation should go out regarding you. Ba'omot, amongst the nations. Shehu bichvodo nigla lechem. That God in his presence, in his glory, revealed himself to you, that you had this amazing experience. So he takes again, looking more carefully at the word nasot, which I said could be understood as to try, but he understands it here as to exalt. This has the meaning of lifting up and greatness. And he gives examples in Isaiah Samachbet, that's 62, chapter 62. Harimu Nes, raise up a banner. And again, Isaiah 49, Harim Nisi, I will raise up my banner. And I guess another example, exa again in Isaiah 30, the Uchenes al Hagivah, and like a banner on the mountain, on the heights, Shehu Zakuf, because it stands straight, the banner is stands straight and is upright. Yes, Lauren. Um, well, the word in the text was not so, not, it was not Ram. Okay. I mean, I, I know they can both mean to lift or raise, but 
why is he jumping to the word Rom when we were talking about Nasso? I'm I'm not sure. He's it, it has both words in it. That's why, right? If it's Rom, um, I, I, I'm not sure where. Looking I, at the text, Nasso Yes, there it is. There's the Nasso. That's why he's talking. Nasso, I see. I, I'm not it's, looking. I don't see Rom. No, he doesn't have to have it. He's simply saying that there is a that. It, he's saying that the word Naso in this context has to do, he understands this in the sense of exalting, of lifting on high. But the examples he used yes. is in that Rashi teaching are he's, not Naso. No, yeah, it is. There's the nace. He uses the word banner, nace, right? Mm -hmm. I read the, I will lift up my banner. It's the nace part that he's focused on. And that the word Naso, he's saying, is related to the word banner, which is that, and there, you know, you can see in the verses that it's talking about to lift up, to lift up. So again, this is, he's understanding the, the Naso as a verb being related to the word banner. And at the end of his comment, he said, because it's lifted up, it's straight up. Well, it's, I thought Nace meant um miracle or, or wonder it does. it does only in the sense that what a banner does is it indicates a place of something right it indicates a presence that's what a banner essentially does is to indicate a presence and the reason why it's understood that's that's sort of a developed meaning miracle is a developed meaning of the word banner to say that this is some a place that indicates the presence of god just as a banner indicates the presence of an army or a, a group or an individual, so likewise. So that's that's the word, that's where the word nace means miracle. Okay. Yes, but thank you. But essentially it means a banner. Okay. Ooh, Thanks. But, sure. I'm glad you asked. I think a lot of people might wonder that too. Uva avur tie yirato and for the purpose that his fear should be. Al yedei shiri'item oto, and be, because you saw him, yiru me, me, uh, um, yes, um, av, me, uyam, right? They, uh, they were, they feared and they dreaded, right? So in other words, what they, what he's saying here is, because you saw him, that he is, that when you saw him, you were in deep fear and dread. Tedu, you should know ki ein zulato that there is nothing other than God. But tiru mi panav, and you should you should fear God's presence, the presence of God. Right? There is nothing ultimately uh, to be feared other than God. I think that's the point he's making here. That they they had this experience in coming into the presence of God and understanding the degree to which God is to be feared. And I know, you know, it's a, it's just a real uh, old, what can I say, a chestnut that there are people who don't like this concept. They don't like they like they understand the concept of loving God, but they don't understand the concept of fearing God, and they don't really like it. And the truth is that it's a very important element in terms of trying to come to grips with what are we talking about when we're talking about God. So, going on. And the people stood from a distance. And Moses entered into the cloud or the, the fog, the mist. Asher Sham Elohim, where God's presence was, that God's presence was there in this dense fog, this mist. And they watched Moses doing this. Nigash El Ha'arafel, he walked over to the uh, fog or the mist, etc. Vifnim Mishalosh Nechitzot. Okay. In other words, what this is saying is that Moses entered into three three levels, uh, three partitions that we understand uh, um, divide us from the divine presence. 
mechitza, right? A partition. And that God, that Moses was able to enter all three to, dr to, to draw close to God. Koshech, darkness, anan, a cloud, the arafel, and fog. So these are obviously are metaphoric words that, that talk about, you know, uh, the fact that we don't always sense the divine presence in our world. And that's because of the mechitzot that are there. Shine'emar, as it states, Fahahar Bo'er Ba'esh, the mountain was uh, in flames, with in flames, Ad Lev HaShamayim, to the heart of hev of the heavens. Choshech Anan Ba'arafel, darkness, cloud, and fog. Arafel Hu Av, okay, so it says uh, Arafel is thick, uh, Ha'anan is the thickness of the cloud. Shine'emarlo, as it says regarding, I think, to Moses, anochi ba'elecha ve'av ha'anan. As God says to Moses, behold, I'm going to come to you in the deepest part, the thickest part of the cloud. And we'll need to stop right here. So we're almost finished, of course, in Parshat Yitro. And I will stop the share. Okay. So stop the recording and hope people will enjoy this.